Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. This podcast avoids stereotypes and biases in favor of the lived experiences of those we can best learn from. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 156 of The Criminologist Podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. This week, I am very proud to be sharing my interview with Jonathan Fisher. Jonathan is a writer, film director, and raconteur. Jonathan was raised in the Bronx, and after earning a master's degree in transportation, he pursued a childhood dream by working for the subway system for 26 years. But in 2013, he joined Seeing for Ourselves as its storyteller. Project Lives was his first book. Writing and directing the film in a whole new way allowed him to cross another item off his bucket list by throwing himself into film world. Jonathan is going to share all sorts of insights with us today, up to and including, of course, his documentary in a whole new way. I could go on and on and on about the awards that this documentary has won, but I literally don't have the time to do that. Let me just read a handful of film reviews to give you an idea of the impact that this film has had. Despite the undeniably important reality behind the action taken by subjects of this documentary, in a whole new way feels uplifting and hopeful for a better future. Eloquently narrated and thoughtfully put together, this documentary proves people can affect change. That if communities come together, we can make the world a better place. That's a film review from Infinity Film Festival over in London. One more here from Magma Film Awards. A film about the camera's power and the injustice of the American justice system. Brilliantly shot with great force, the filmmaker makes us aware of one of the biggest problems facing American society today. During the course of this interview with Jonathan, I was reminded of the value of perspective taking. One of the aims of this podcast is to tear down biases and misperceptions around justice impacted individuals and as you're about to hear from Jonathan photography is a great way to do that anything we can do to address what I sometimes refer to as the otherism of our clients right those other people they're not like us this whole binary approach that we take in criminal justice really has to be addressed and perspective taking is a great way to get at that super excited to share this interview with jonathan so with no further ado allow me to share my interview with jonathan fisher and i will see you all on the other side Well, hello and welcome to the show, Jonathan. Before we do a deep dive on some of the truly amazing projects that you and your team are involved with, why don't we begin with you simply introducing yourself to our listeners, maybe highlighting some of what your journey has been like thus far. Sure. And thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm a boomer, uh, born and raised in New York City. And, you know, there were three principles in our nonprofit Um, And we like to say about ourselves that we're three New Yorkers of three different generations. So our founder was a member of the silent generation. Our photography teacher is a millennial. And I'm right now, I'm in the middle. I'm the boomer. So I was born in uh, in New York City. I was raised in the Bronx. Um, My father was an IRS agent ordering corporate tax returns. Uh, My mom was an elementary school teacher. She taught in the Belmont section of the Bronx. And if you're old enough to remember that doo-wop group, Dion and the Belmonts, that was her turf. 
<laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> Um, so there was there was no connection to the justice system at that level. But, you know, if you kind of spread the net a little bit further, you might find some people. I think, for example, my second cousin, Barry, was on the transit police force in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, I, re- I remember him over at our house regaling my mother with tales of cleaning up suicides from the tracks, which is a t- you know, terrible situation. There are way too many of those in the New York City subway system. Um, he would find himself bounced from the transit police in the 1980s for brutality of all things, kind of ahead of his time and not something that made my mother proud of him or his own mother proud of him for that matter. Um, Then moving along, my big sister, she got her law degree from uh, Northeastern in 1990 and wound up uh, working for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts court system, auditing judges, not auditing, but editing judges' opinions. Um, and then our 18-year-old son right now is thinking maybe of becoming an FBI agent. I mean, he certainly wants to be doing uh, hostage rescues. And uh, so in September, he's going to be heading to Boston University, which has a criminal justice program. So, you know, in that sense, there's some sort of uh, family connection. Um, so I grew up in the Bronx, like a mile north of Yankee Stadium. So you imagine a guy, a boy, 1950s near Yankee Stadium, who my childhood hero was, you know, <laughs> number seven. Um, we lived in New York, in the Bronx until 1960, when somebody else you may have heard of, Robert Moses. Uh, he was, uh, you know, the the the, the, uh, the power broker, the master builder in, in the city, who was shoving expressways every which way around the city. He built the Cross Bronx Expressway through our extended family's neighborhood in 1960. And so we had, went reeling to Queens. Um, and one of the major impacts of that is that I became a Mets fan instead of a Yankees fan. Um, <laughs> you're, you're better off, Jonathan. You're better off. <laughs> you're, you must be a Twins fan. <laughs> yes, I have no love for the Yankees, as you yeah, can imagine. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, you know, what I, what I noticed about Queens back then was that I don't think I've seen this anywhere. It's just my own observation that, it's, that it was like the Texas of New York City, that it was the biggest borough in New York City. And I quickly noticed when we moved there that people had this attitude, you know, like they were all full of themselves and... Uh, this was my friends and everybody else who I encountered. And I think maybe it may, ex- it may explain something about the personality of uh, John McEnroe, who's a little bit younger than me, and uh, the 45th president, who's a little bit older than me. That's my own you know, I, uh, personal observation. Um, both uh, McEnroe appears in the film, and both McEnroe and uh, the 45th president appear in the book briefly. Um, So when I became a Mets fan, I became a follower of Tom Seaver, uh, number 41, and now I live in a zip code, 04107, and since I'm 72 years old and forget my zip code all the time, the way I remember, (laughs) you're you're shaking your head. I can relate to using those mnemonic (laughs) memory tricks. (laughs) To address my own age-related yes. cognitive decline, as I oh, refer to it. Oh, man. Oh, does it affect us all? Oh, boy. Um, in that era, I became a fan of the New York City subway, so I was one of those obnoxious brats who makes sure he gets in the fir- first car, rushes to the front, shoves everybody else out, out of the way so we can look out the front, to- front window. Um, I also developed um, a little bit of an interest in film at the time. And then in uh, 1967, I went up went upstate to college. Uh, it was called Harper College at the time, which was this, or now known as the State University of New York at Binghamton, now known simply as Binghamton University. I did a uh, BA there in medieval history, but also became chair, wound up chairman of the transportation committee on the film committee. So it was a way of amplifying those interests. And then I, after that, I took what's now called a gap year. I don't know if they were calling it gap years back then. Um, 1971, 1972, I had put a backpack on, headed off to Europe, um, and by the spring of 72, was I, I was on the hippie trail to the east, and <laughs> you may know about that as well, some of your listeners may know. Back in the 60s, the early 70s, you know, all these Westerners with a pack on their back just started in Istanbul making the same series of stops all the way out to the east. And I think um, in India, one of the branches headed north to Nepal, and one of the the other branch headed south to Bali, and those were like the hippie havens in those days. You know, people would sit around smoking drugs, whatnot. Though, though a kind of a detour off the southern branch, as I recall, was Australia, where a lot of Brits were headed to find work. 
So, you know, that I mentioned the gap year because it was in that in those travels that I had my first minor encounter with uh, law breaking. I just want to say in a tangential basis that I flirted, let's put air quotes around that, flirted with money laundering and drug smuggling. Um, and this was not for personal gain. You know, it was, it was really like personal favors for people who I encountered on that trail and afterwards. And the reason I mention it is because of my current involvement now in the criminal justice system, I look back and see just how easy it is for people to come involved. You know, that peer pressure is incredibly powerful. Even if you're trying to do the right thing, you know, you could wind up on the wrong side of the law. So it's made me much more sympathetic to the people uh, who I'm now uh, trying to serve. Um, and that was the end of the gap year. After that, I, I took a master's in transportation, furthering that interest, um, at Northwestern University, which is in Evanston, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, as you know. Um, and then as soon as I got the Master of Science degree, came back to New York City, worked for the subway system, fulfilled my childhood dream, worked for the, for the MTA from 74 to 2000, 26 years. After that, I took early retirement, did all kinds of, uh, wound up working with various firms and agencies, became a fan of photography in that era, but realized very quickly I didn't have the personality for this because the, the, be, the, best, the best pictures were where you got up close and personal with strangers taking candid shots. I could not do that. You know, even with a long lens, I couldn't do that. And, <laughs> and then on the other hand, to be a real artist in this field, you sort of had to, to develop and print your own photographs. And I live in this tiny Garrett apartment in the West Village in New York City. That was a non-starter. So I had to throw that dream over the side. I would say um, in that era, I also became a victim of crime, so I saw things from that end. I got mugged. Not that seriously, I survived, but it, you know, it was just sort of an experience we, we, all, we all went through. In 2000, my wife and I decided to move up to the northern suburbs because we were going to plan a family, needed more room. We were in Hastings on Hudson for, from 2000 to 2007 and then moved up to Ossining from 2007 to 2017. Ossining is, is a prison town. You know, it's where Sing Sing Prison is located. And so we were, you know, we always had one ear peeled for the sirens going off to indicate there was an escape, you know. Um, <laughs> and then in 2017, uh, my wife, who was a New Englander, you know, looked at me and said, you know, I am tired of New York. I don't like the noise. I don't like the pollution. I don't like the attitude. You know, it's my turn. So uh, by then we had two kids. We just uh, put them in the covered wagon, hitched up the horses, and headed north. And so here I am in Cape Elizabeth, a suburb of Portland, Maine. You mentioned amongst your interest, Jonathan, film and photography. So let's go there. I'm going to leave for our listeners a link to your website, Seeing for Ourselves. Um, but I know within that website, you you invite those with an interest um, in the field of photography or or those who simply want to to help with your very worthwhile effort, a chance to do that. Talk about what that might look like for folks who, again, have that background in photography that may be interested in, in what you and your team are all about. Oh, it'd be wonderful if you could reach out to us. Um, uh, cause our, our photography teacher, Chelsea Davis, who's uh, did such a, such a fantastic job in her first two, uh, projects. She's now kind of lost to us because, um, of how well this second project at the probation part, department succeeded. She got herself a permanent position there and she went to Columbia university. She got a master's of social work. She's got a whole new career path, you know, wonderful for her. Uh, but it leaves George and I bereft. So, you know, neither of us are equipped to teach photography. And if, certainly if anybody out there listening has those skills, that would be wonderful. We could, it could be te taught uh, in person or virtually. Right now, we've actually, we're actually starting up our third project, and, uh, which is, and I can tell you about that in a, in a few words. It's uh, equipping and training high school age youth to picture their climate future. And you may say, okay, our practice is generally about dealing with marginalized people. How does this play into that? Our view is that if we grown-ups are so blithely willing to settle youth with a possible calamity in the future, then that makes youth kind of marginalized. And we think, you know, apart from celebrities like Greta Thunberg, um, their view, the, the, the views and the imagery uh, of young people in this area have, you know, not really counted for a whole lot. So... We're hoping that this new project will, uh, will, will, you know, give us some some imagery that will make an impact. 
Now, as I said, you know, we don't have a photography teacher, so we're asking these high schoolers to depend on their own skills, which a lot of them have, frankly. I mean, even my own son, you know, with his cell phone, with his iPhone 13, is taking way better pictures than I could ever have taken. <laughs> I mean, these guys, you know, it's a different generation now. So, you know, but I still think teaching would really, you know, help get a better result. So that, if, you know, if you have those kind of skills, reach out. If you're good at promoting um projects, especially like on social media, you know, George is 80 years old, I'm 72. We're not really big, you know, <laughs> we're not adept, you know, with that, that kind of thing. So if you have those skills, that would be wonderful. And, you know, you've been helping us find things like your great podcast, Joe. And that was, you know, I'm sure if we had somebody who was a researcher, they could do things like that. Let's talk about some of the the, the manifestations of your work, your, your various projects. One that I've seen is your your amazing documentary film entitled "In a Whole New Way." Um, I've seen the film; it's incredible. I love using media to get points across. You just noted a podcast as a way of doing that. Give some insights as to what the what that project was all about, your, your amazing documentary in a whole new way. Well, um, after we finished our first project in the housing, in the housing projects of New York City, we got pointed down to its probation, probation department. Because um, what New York City figured was, okay, you guys created a new image of, of public housing and the people who live there. Maybe you could do the same kind of thing for uh, people on probation. Because they too, like public housing residents, have been suffering from this mocking media image for the last generation, uh, and that's you know hurt. It's, it's hurt the practice of criminal justice, frankly, as well as our you know the prospects of the of the clients of the probation department. So they were very anxious for us to get started. We applied for a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts, and luckily enough, we had the support of one of New York Senators, Kirsten Gillibrand, um, and that's what you know put us over the line. I'm sure. Uh, so we got that NEA grant that came through in November of 2017, and by January of 2018, the probation department had created a budgeted slot for Chelsea Davis, our photography teacher, and we were off to the races. So that's how that whole uh, how pro- whole project um, got got underway. Um, Chelsea started teaching, you know, in the spring of 2018 in. Uh, you know, the seven decentralized neighborhoods of New York City where, where the probation department conducts its practice. And it was a slow start, certainly slower than in, in, at the housing projects, which was, our, which was our first initiative. And, you know, it's understandable because, you know, it's a sensitive area, you know, the, crim- the justice system, and we were a complete unknown, and um, you know, a lot of skepticism had to be overcome. And so, so for example, in the spring semester of 2018 in Brownsville, two people might show up for a class. Um, but, you know, Chelsea kept with it. And uh, right now, uh, classes are oversubscribed the day they're announced, and there's a waiting list of 200 to get in. So word of mouth does something, you know. I mean, we, we didn't use social media or anything like that to promote it, but it was really word of mouth um, that enabled the program to get going. And... Um, you know, while she was busy doing the teaching, I would, my job was to look at the backstory because what our practice was was combining the photographs that are that arise out of our projects with a backstory about the the city service involved. We had done that with with our first uh, initiative and the housing projects where we did a did a whole backstory about public housing and that combined with the photographs taken by the uh, project residents, and we wanted to do the same thing this time. So I started burrowing around in the uh, New York City Probation Department, um, which was a trip. You know, one of the things I th- that most astonished me about all that was uh, discovering the role that probation, the probation function serves in sentencing. I had no idea, and, I, and you know, this is on a film and, a, and book for that matter, and I don't think, you know, 99 out of Americans don't know about this. That, um, that the probation department is called upon to conduct pre-sentence investigations uh, for, for defendants who you know, are found guilty or, or plead guilty, and even some who plead guilty as a result of a plea deal. And the recommendations for a sentence are accepted by the respective judge like 98% of the time. So, you know, we think the judge is sentencing somebody. It's really the probation function that is sentencing somebody. So that was like a total revelation. Um, one, uh, one of the, I, I was going through the files and I stumbled upon 
the pre-sentence investigation <coughs> excuse me, conducted for uh, Bernie Getz. Bernie Getz was New York City's subway shooter in 1986. The guy who, you know, when he was approached by a bunch of youths in a way that he found threatening, decided to shoot them. Um, and so you, th- that pre-sentence investigation was, was an exception where its recommendation, I could see, was not accepted by the judge. And the, the, the investigation did recommend probation and the judge, thanks to the notoriety of the case, you know, around the entire country, couldn't, I evidently felt he couldn't go that far. So Getz did wind up serving time. But I can tell you uh, about another probation, uh, about a probation official who started a few years before I turned up there to, you know, to do my research, um, Kate. And um, when Kate moved into her office um, as a new probation department employee, she started, you know, opening the drawers and going through the files. And she stumbled upon the pre-sentence investigation conducted of Mark David Chapman. Now, Kate was a lifelong fan of John Lennon. So you can imagine her reaction. I mean, she was hyperventilating. Her, you know, colleagues from the other offices had to come rushing by, you know, to see what it was all about. And curiously, curiously enough, Joe, this is an echo of something that happened in the early 1960s at an IRS office where the young women there who were in charge of opening the envelopes mailed by uh, citizens with their tax returns, she opened an envelope one day to discover the tax return of John Lennon's own hero, Elvis. She began. She began to scream nonstop to the point where she lost her job. Oh Lord, super fan indeed. <laughs> and and maybe talk about the the documentary in a whole new way, specifically how you and your team endeavor to capture that perspective of the individual with those lived experiences. I feel there's so much value in in that, and we've talked about the the impact that that media can have versus dry recidivism statistics or, or that other type of sort of quantitative data. Um, but for someone who wants to view that documentary, give them a sneak peek of what that would be like seeing it again from how you, how you empowered those individuals with photography. Well, okay. In the, in the photography classes, of course, we, with the way Ch- Chelsea conducted the classes, they were uh, two hour classes and, she would spend the first hour um, uh, showing people the masters of the art. And it would be, uh, you know, Cartier-Bresson, or it would be William Eggleston, uh, you know, people of that stature. And then the other, the second half of the, uh, of the period, uh, they would be going, th- they would be showing and telling their own photographs, you know, on a screen in front of the room. And uh, then everybody would, you know, kind of critique and say, well, did this, does this, uh, did this uh, exemplify the lesson that was taught last, the previous week or not? And, you know, it was a 12-week class, and it, was, it covered everything from camera angle to lighting to, uh, you know, depth of field. I mean, in, in, in our initiative at the housing projects, we used code, partly because we got a donation of cameras from Kodak, we, we used Kodak point-and-shoot cameras. They were disposable cameras. You know, film, you know, is, is very, very beautiful. There was an advantage to that. And also there was a certain discipline forced on, on the photographers because they knew they only had so many shots. In this go-round at the probation department, we did have a, a donation of uh, a, a digital single-lens reflex cameras from Sigma Corporation of America. And it, was, it actually was more appropriate for this population because whereas at that, in the housing projects, the people who we taught were seniors and kids who didn't really have career aspirations, here... Half the rationale for this enterprise was imparting a marketable skill, and so what we were able to do with the Sigma cameras was was give give people a sense of visual storytelling. I mean, even if they weren't going to become photographers per se, visual storytelling is one of the the, uh, the skills most in demand. You know, in the, in the in, by businesses nowadays, even if it may ultimately be taken over by the equivalent of ChatGPT and you know all kinds of artificial engineering, it really pays to know this. So, you know, those were the, that was the way we conducted those classes. And great photographs, you know, arose from that, that we staged gallery exhibits all over New York City uh, of them. Um, and what, what ultimately we were supposed to do with that, same thing as, as in our first enterprise at the housing projects, was to combine those photographs with a backstory about probation, which is why I was doing the research, and put it out in the book. And that was what was supposed to happen in 2019, 2020. But what we were shocked to find out was that in 2019, by, by 2019, the, the whole market for illustrated books 
was doing very badly. I mean, it cost so much to to print to print these things. It was kind of beyond the price point of uh, of, of, of any any potential buyer. So we had that to contend with. And then in 2020, the pandemic hit, which effectively shut down the publishing industry, you know, through its disruption of supply chains. So George and Chelsea looked at me and said, hey, you're supposed to be the storyteller. You better think of something else. So fortunately, we had this footage of interviews that, che- that I had had Chelsea conduct with the participants because that was going to be a resource for my writing of the book. You know, so I took a second look at this, and I, you know, I was, I was captivated uh, by by the participants' magnetic personalities, and I figured, well, if I'm, you know, if this is the way it affects me, maybe it'll affect other people as well. So here in my man cave in in Cape Elizabeth, outside of Portland, Maine, I started stitching together that footage with footage we had of gallery exhibits and openings. And other footage that I was able to license from stock, ha- stock houses, and other footage which I was which was copyrighted, and yet I was able to use through the magic of fair use. And I don't know if your listeners know about that, but you actually can you, you know use copyrighted material if you obey certain rules that that the Congress has set up for that. And the primary one of which is that you're repurposing. The material, you know, and of course we were doing that. I mean, we have we have a clip of Fellini's Eight and a Half, not to enter in, in the movie in a whole new way, and it's not to entertain the audience. It's just as a comparison point with participatory photography that you know that George is making. So we were able to, you know, so we got a lot of foot. I, you know, I got a lot of pieces, and I was just I'm not a film. You know, I've never made a film before, but I started watching and rewatching Ken Burns's films to figure out how it might be done. Because, you know, like Ken Burns, what, you know, this wasn't going to be a character-driven documentary. It was going to be an issue-driven co- documentary, you know, with a lot of titling, or, you know, record narration required. You know, so I started watching baseball and Vietnam, or Vietnam War, you know, seeing how we did things. And I figured, you know, okay, maybe I could do the same kind of thing. So I started, you know, putting everything together, and then I found a professional uh, filmmaker in Portland... Uh, who I could use to take things to a whole new level. I was working on iMovie, which is, you know, your basic consumer software that every Mac user has has available. Uh, but he was fortunately able to, able to put it on Final Cut Pro and uh, create a film out of that. And, lo and, and then we got the film approved by the probation department and by the key participants, you know, which was important to us, that we weren't going to go forward unless we, unless everybody was okay with it. And so by the beginning of 2021, we had this half-hour documentary. Um, and uh, we figured, well, how do you get it out there? I mean, the traditional way is to put it out on the festival circuit. And that's what we did starting in May of 2021. Uh, and, it took, and it toured the festivals right up until now. I mean, right, right at this moment, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's finally been winding down. And um, what we we were we were we were while well, we were pleased that the film had attracted notice across the political spectrum, you know, on the left to Noam Chomsky and on GOP legislators on the right. That was our original intention, and you know we we were glad, but we weren't totally surprised because we crafted the film that way. But we were totally astonished by the film's reception on the film festival circuit abroad. That you know that everywhere from Brazil to Bali, from Stockholm to Singapore, Uganda to the U.S. I mean, both in Russia and Ukraine, both in Iran and Israel. You know, people who don't agree on anything, you know, all gravitated towards this film, which show, showing the power not of me as a filmmaker, obviously, but of the participants and of American probation, and this whole idea that you can undo negative stereotypes in the media if you if you empower people to create their own imagery. As I listen to you speak, Jonathan, I, 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 I'm almost reflecting on how the, the value added of your project is almost twofold. It is, as you've articulated, empowering those clients with those skills, those marketable skills, whether it's directly related to photography or, as you noted, storytelling. But the other value um, is also of addressing those biases and stereotypes that people have about the about the probation system. So again, it, again, sort of a, a two-for-one a two you're getting out of this. Yes, that's right. And of course, with, by undoing those biases, what we were trying to do, which was really the ultimate aim of the project, was uh, encourage probation to return from its uh, 
to its real rehabilitative roots where it was still punitive, which it still is in many jurisdictions around the country. And we felt that doing so would um, al allow probation to be viewed more positively by the media and ultimately by the justice system. And so, so people would view it more widely as an effective alternative to locking people up, which, as you know, better than anyone, Joe, we do more than anybody else in the world. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and regular listeners of the podcast will know we're 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 kindred spirits in that regard as far as addressing those those biases and the misconceptions. The the tagline that I end every episode with is there's no them, there's only us. We we have to get out of this binary approach we take to, to criminal justice, this us versus they approach. And I think your your film in a whole new way does a great job of doing that, of 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 humanizing the journey of those folks in the system well hearing so, hearing something like that from someone like you joe that is a dream come true because you know that that was our hope and prayer from the very beginning i was so excited to talk about your film in a whole new way i i bypass bypassed at least chronologically and you've referenced it your book project lives which is where this all really started along with and you've noted them george carano and chelsea davis do you want to maybe fill in some of the the gaps of of me leapfrogging right to your film and talk about the book project lives yeah sure it goes back in a way to the founding of our nonprofit, which is a story the origin story we actually is part of the film um, George and I both worked for the MTA, as I mentioned. I mentioned I worked for the MTA until 2000. Actually, he was with me from 74 until excuse me, 1999 when he took early retirement. And he devoted his life, he started to devote some time to his passion for photography. In 2002, he was in London and stumbled onto an exhibit of very different photography in a church basement. He had never seen anything like this before and realized that this was... Uh, what, the, what the intention of photography was, was to equip and train marginalized people to take control of their own public narrative by documenting their lives photographically. Um, and he was just so struck by this. Um, it, 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 participatory photography has its origins, um, many people say, in 1992 when a couple of women who were performing, uh, were doing aid work in rural China um, uh, equipped and trained uh, Chinese peasant women to document their lives photographically. And what they realized, it, it's just an idea that one of them had, and the resulting photographs were so much more evocative than the photography that had been taken in, this, in these environments by local officials that they started publicizing the work uh, and their practice. And the practice began to grow and grow and grow until uh, you know, in, 19, uh, in 2002, George stumbled upon it. But the practice also, you could trace back roots to Frederick Douglass. Uh, Frederick Douglass, um, as many of your listeners know, was uh, early on, like in the, in, the, in the 1850s, realized the power of photography. And especially what, what was encountering the horrible caricatures of black Americans that were so pervasive at the time. I mean, these, the, it was totally derogatory image up to that point. And so Frederick Douglass made it a point of sitting for as many photographs as he could and, in fact, became the most widely photographed American of the 19th century. Um, and then, uh, you know, a little bit later, W.E.B. Du Bois added to, uh, added to all that by noting that the identity of the photographer mattered maybe as much, if not more, than what was photographed. So those are kind of ancient roots of participatory photography. Anyway, what, you know, so George was so smitten by this photography that he resolved to uh, stage an exhibit of this kind of thing when he got back to New York City. Uh, and he did that. He staged the, the show Unbroken in a fancy New York City Chelsea gallery in 2004. And, uh, you know, just serendipitously, uh, one of the world's leading photojournalists, Philip Jones Griffiths, was in the city at the time. He stumbled upon this exhibit, um, and he was struck, and he took George aside and said, look, you know, there's nothing like this in this country, so you, why don't you be the American who does this over here? And with that encouragement, George founded the, uh, you know, Seeing for Ourselves in 2010. In 2010, I was working at the New York City Housing Authority, and um, I arranged, at George's request, a meeting uh, for him with one of the top executives there. 
And George said, figured, all right, you know, the, 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 our, the first initiative, our nonprofit, should be public housing. Why not? Because he could see that that you know the the, the imagery of uh, public housing as and its residents had been you know terrible for a generation and more for more. And in fact, many people trace it to the 1972 implosion of the Pruitt Igoe development in St. Louis, which was broadcast on national you know on Walter Cronkite on the TV news in America. But really, it brought it wound up being seen all over the world. And if there was one uh, image, so to speak, of public housing that people had it. You know, it was that. You know, Pruitt Igo. Um, so George figured participatory photography could help undo, you know, that kind of uh, imagery, which had led to the government backing away from funding, which led to crime and disrepair, which led to even more uh, 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 of a withdrawal by the government, which led to terrible media coverage, and you know, this vicious cycle again, on and on and on. And, you know, we thought, well, maybe we can, you know, cut the cord here, you know, and maybe, you know, try to undo do some, some of this stuff. So he got the idea accepted by the executive of the Housing Authority. And I, I, I don't think anybody else but George Carano in the entire world could have uh, convinced them. I mean, he, that, that's his forte. I mean, he knows how to talk to people the right way. Um, and, you know, the Housing Authority was this staid bureaucratic organization, and they were being beat up in the tabloids every week for mismanagement. Um, the you know most people, most executives would have said no, but we found the right George found the right guy and talked to him the right way, and so we got the go ahead. And then at the same time, George serendipitously was able to find Chelsea Davis to, to, to serve as the photography teacher um, through a connection from a relative and a friend. Um, and it turned out that Chelsea had been conducting just this form of uh, photography teaching. Um, at in the oncology ward of St. Louis Children's Hospital, um, we show this in the film, and uh, she recollects that uh, one of the ch- one of the children who one of her students was deaf, and when the picture when uh, his fo- his photographs uh, it turned out were going to be of people's hands, and that re- re- that brought home to her the the power of participatory photography and what you could achieve when you don't have this, you know, this intermediary of an outside observer and people are taking uh, photographs of their own lives. So with all that said, Chelsea started uh, teaching in the housing projects uh, in 2010, went through 2013, 2014, uh, maybe 15 projects in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. Very easy to recruit in contrast to how it would later be, you know, in the probation department. Uh, taught kids and taught kids and seniors uh, Kodak disposable cameras. We could, Dell gave us computers, um, and uh, it led to shows, you know, all over the city. And uh, you know, George at one point said, "Okay, let's combine the photographs with the, with a backstory about uh, public housing, put it in a book, and maybe people will buy it." And it was it was kind of tough to find the publisher. Because the rap was, well, this population, you know, is uh, who's going to buy a book of pictures about them? And they don't buy photographs, they don't buy books themselves, you know, the, 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 old, the old cliches. But uh, we had a great agent, David Wilk. He got us placed at the uh, Powerhouse, which is the, one of the foremost art book publishers in the country. Uh, and they put out Project Lives in 2015. Um, and it did, you know, fantastically well. I mean, not in terms of sales, but in terms of reproduction of the photographs by so many media channels you know the new imagery got in front of tens of millions of eyeballs and so that that is what did the trick that's what encouraged the city and the state to to restart funding and maybe undo that vicious cycle um and convinced by that just going back to, to tying back to the earlier story that's what convinced the city okay these guys are onto something let's send them down to the probation department when I was researching this interview, Jonathan, I I stumbled across the aforementioned term, participatory photography. Talk about then making that bridge from participatory photography to participatory probation. Well, you know, in the research I was doing at the probation department, I talked to so many you know, great officials with so many great insights who were able to explain the practice to me. Uh, Vinnie Karik was the guy who said, um, you know, the client has to be willing to change. And uh, he must take charge of his own treatment. I'm saying he because, you know, 90% of the clients were male. Um, the, ch- the client has to take charge of his own treatment. And, you know, we want the client in the driver's seat, not riding shotgun. 
And to me, that it was, you know, it was such a powerful image. And it's so naturally tied back to what our, our photography practice was all about, you know, like bingo. And that, you could see that's why the, the, the participants responded so strongly to, to our program because, you know, they, had, they were experiencing, experiencing the same kind of thing as, uh, as clients of the probation department. Um, so, but you know, Vinny wasn't unique. There are so many uh, great officials there at the at the agency, and they were doing uh, all kinds of things that we mentioned in the film. Whether whether it was uh, uh, art initiatives with in tandem with the local community, and uh, not punishing so much for technical violations of probation, and actually giving advance notice of a home visit instead of you know come crashing through your door. Um, wow, what an innovation! Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, all of things, all of these uh, things put together, I, you know, I think helped uh, keep the city safe. I mean, really, you could talk about recidivism. You talk, you talk about that a lot, Joe. You talk about crime desistance all the time. But if you wanted to talk about outcomes, maybe the ultimate outcome is a safer city. And certainly that's what, that, you know, Anna Bermudez, the, the, the commissioner of probation, agreed, you know, and she, she or in all modesty, claims credit for it. And, I, you know, we, we agree with her, you know, that her practice has helped. New York become one of the safest big cities in the country, as well as the least incarcerated. I'm going to steal that term that you just used, Jonathan, taking the the client from the riding shotgun to being in the driver's seat, because it is all (laughs) about that, you know, that self-determination. And and whenever we talk about evidence-based practices, it is, again, all about we need to do stuff with our clients and not to our clients. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) And that's where that word term, you know, participatory probation comes from. Um, regular listeners of the show will, will uh, know the name Fergus McNeil, who's a criminologist over in Glasgow. But he's on this pathway as well. I know he's done work with not just photography, but involving those with lived experiences to share their perspectives via songwriting and then releasing those songs. But again, it's just this theme, which I love, of participation and, and breaking down this as I noted, binary us versus them, I'm going to fix you versus empowering you to fix yourself. That's right. When I, when when I train practitioners, one of my go-to expressions is that, uh, you know, they, they got to get out of that expert chair and realize that clients are the experts of themselves. There's, there's a myriad number of pathways into, into criminality, into addiction, but the clients themselves are the experts on how to get out of, out of that, that minefield, if you will, they are the experts of themselves. Tap into that expertise, which you and your team have done a great job doing, Jonathan. And you mentioned Fergus, Joe, uh, because for, uh, funnily enough, um, there was a European effort paralleling ours. Um, it started, I think, in 2014, where they empowered people on probation. And, and it, like in England, the, the probation includes parole. And it's all, most often referred to as people who, who are released early as opposed to having an alternative to prison. But be that as it may, uh, they conducted uh, what they call a photo voice project with, with, the, with that population themselves. And they did it in England. They did it in Germany. They did it in Scotland. And uh, so we wind up, that's in our book. And uh, I reached out to Ferguson for permission to reproduce photographs for that project in our book. And he said, yeah, great. <laughs> Go do it. Because then he, 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 everything, everything ties around, Joe. Yes, it's all serendipitous, as you as you noted earlier, um, Jonathan. I like to be forward thinking when uh, when we meet again. If I've got you back on the show in a year or two, look into your crystal ball. What do you envision we might be chatting about in your in your utopian best case scenario? Um, well, I'm hoping we are talking about how probation has finally left the punitive era behind. Uh, and that many uh, on many more people are being offered probation and consequently instead of being sent to prison that people in prison have been have been diverted into probation that people in on probation have been diverted upstream to diversion or out of the criminal justice system altogether uh, if we've contrib- if we wind, wind up having contributed to that great if not it's okay you know as long as it, as long as it takes place a lot of people um, lot of, it was when I was down, down at the probation department in 2018 there was a lot of uh, excitement about who would be doing the pre-sentence investigation of Harvey Weinstein if he were fa- if he were ultimately convicted you know and um, I'm sure that there's the same kind of excitement right now because the famous personality just uh, got indicted in the city. And so 
who knows, maybe um, that personality will be ultimately a client of New York City probation, may ultimately en enroll in the photography program. Who can tell? <laughs> Jonathan, I'm going to load up the uh, episode description of this podcast with as many links as I can with your various projects in a whole new way, your Seeing for Ourselves website. Jonathan, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. And until we meet next time, my friend, keep doing the great job that you're doing. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you to all you great listeners out there. All right. And I, I'm not going to say go Yankees, but go Twins. <laughs> go, I can say go Mets. They're in the National League. Go Mets. Go Twins. <laughs> Take care, Jonathan. Until next time. You too, Joe. I cannot wait to connect with Jonathan Fisher again. What an amazing individual with such passion and an infinite mindset. I encourage you to check out the links for his projects, which I have left in the episode description of this podcast. If you visit his website in a whole new way dot com, you will see contact information. So if you want to work with Jonathan and his team, please, I encourage you reach out to them. Not sure if you caught it, but Jonathan did mention the term desistance. And of course, if you are a regular listener of this podcast, you know that desistance from crime is right in our wheelhouse. And to that end, my dear friend and colleague, Nicole Kimberly Staley and I have rolled out our new program model entitled TIDES. TIDES stands for Trauma Informed Desistance, which is a holistic approach in supporting marginalized individuals on their pathways to change. Now, TIDES is a custom designed program model intended to augment your agency's current evidence-based interventions. We believe an experience of safety is a prerequisite to any kind of change. Many marginalized and justice impacted individuals have histories of trauma and may be re-traumatized during their contact with justice and social service systems, preventing them from evoking intrinsic motivation, learning, and sustaining long-term change. Addressing this, TIDES includes trauma-responsive practices while incorporating current knowledge and research on pathways into crime, such as risk-needs responsivity approaches, as well as pathways out of crime, those anchored in desistance theory. Now, let me quickly share some program highlights with you all. Our program includes the neuroscience of trauma-informed care, which I think really sets us apart from other approaches. This would include, of course, safety and self-regulation, as well as trauma-responsive supervision. As mentioned, we also look at those pathways into crime via the r, &R approaches around assessment and good cognitive behavioral interventions as well as those pathways out of crime. Desistance teaches us all about the importance of identity transformation, as well as redemption. We do these redemption rituals and evoke hope and agency in the client. And of course, we build on human and social capital. If you are intrigued by this, please reach out and we can provide you with information and have a nice informative conversation we will be back next week with a fresh episode in the meantime you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website the paragon group llc.com for training or presentations as to core correctional skills implementation or of course the topic of desistance from crime if you have questions or comments as to this podcast, feel free to contact the show via our email at thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. That's thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook and Instagram pages at The Criminologist Podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. The Criminologist Media Group is also on Twitter. 
give us a follow at Crim Media Group. That's C R I M Media Group. You may also connect with me, Joseph Arvidson, on LinkedIn and follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Hey, lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this podcast. And if you believe in what we're doing on the show, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word. Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the podcast. And of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them. There's only us. Everywhere from Brazil to Bali, from Stockholm to Singapore, Uganda to the U.S., I mean, both in Russia and Ukraine, both in Iran and Israel, you know, people who don't agree on anything, you know, all gravitated towards this film, which show is showing the power, not of me as a filmmaker, obviously, but of the participants and of American probation. And this whole idea that you can undo negative stereotypes in the media if you if you empower people to create their own imagery. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist Podcast and The Criminologist Channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening.